Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And we're back. We're live. We are young talents making way only here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Andrea Gabrielli. I'm your host. And every Tuesday, we keep an eye on the future with our most brilliant school students as we talk about their science projects. And joining me today is James Shigemoto, who just graduated from Kalani High School and carried out a science project regarding um, climatic predictions and particularly global weather patterns. Welcome to the show, James. Thank you so much for having me. It's so interesting. Very nice to have you here, yeah. especially at the beginning of this, at the dawn of this new hurricane season oh, in Hawaii. Oh, I'm so terrified. Interestingly enough, I think a while ago, or Pretty sure it's still going on. It was actually La Nina season uh, that was forecasted by NOAA, and interestingly enough, my data said, "Oh, it's well, kind of <laughs> it's kind of cold." This is exactly what what we are going to be talking about today. Um, so, why did you get interested in uh, predicting weather? So, my first interest was computer science. I always wanted to do something that related to computer science, and I love psychology. So, I'm thinking, what if I could combine them? And when I first found out about machine learning, I was so happy. And then thinking, you know, let's try to predict cancer. And then, as you can see, it didn't really work out well. <laughs> was that part of a previous science project? No, uh, this was completely new. Uh, I'm actually continuing that uh, the cancer research right now just as a side project. But I'm also continuing my weather prediction. But uh, the way the weather prediction happened was I was talking to a mentor I had at the time. And she suggested, you know, predicting cancer is really difficult because of the data sets. That's the most important thing for machine learning. Right. And I decided, okay, well, weather. We're in Hawaii. Sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. Why is that? And then that became El Nino because uh, around that time, one of my family members was in Puerto Rico during one of the hurricanes. And the hurricanes. And um, El Nino, I believe, uh, let's have our first slide up so we can understand better what El Nino is. Yeah. So El Nino is a change in both wind, sp wind direction and speed as well as sea surface temperature. Right. So it really depends on how it works. In certain seasons, it's expected for it to be higher than normal. So I believe during the December, around the December uh, season, well, month, it's supposed to be slightly higher than usual. And because of that, you have to change it to, you have to change the way it's measured. So, so in this cartoon, for example, the one on the left illustrates a normal weather pattern. And so we can see we have South America and Southeast Asia. The trade winds basically are responsible for blowing uh, hot, uh, warm, warm and ocean water. water towards Asia. Yes. During El Nino years, uh, we sort of see a reverse An inverse of pattern. Yes. So how does this? Uh, uh, how often does uh, you know El Nino and an, an El Nino event occur, and what are the consequences of so, this such such inversion, oscillation in the wind and ocean uh, temperatures patterns? So El Nino it really varies. So it can happen every two to seven years, and in that period, it depends on the region. So in certain places you'll have flooding. In certain places you'll have droughts. In certain places because of the droughts, the, the trees will become a lot more brittle, which can make fires a lot more likely. And due to those fires and the lack of water, you're not really able to put them out. Right. So due to that, it can, El Nino has a wide variety of issues, just depending on the region you're in. So for Hawaii, that's generally more hurricanes, more flooding, more, more hurricanes. water. And since uh, our um, hurricane season here in the Central Pacific begin on, begins on actually June the 1st, so that's only a couple of yeah. days from now, I invite you to join our conversation here. You can just call this number here, 808-374-2014, and you can join me and James while we're talking about hurricanes and El Nino. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's have our next slide up so we can understand better some of the effects of these El Nino years. Uh, so here are some figures, some examples. Yes. Can you describe what so we have here? In one of the, in only one instance of El, in El Nino, over 24,000 people have died, as well as over $34 billion in damages. And that's just in one instance of El Nino. That's not a combined of it. That's 1997, 1998, yeah? Yes, that was, that was a strong... That was considered one of the worst in oh. history, at the, if I remember correctly. Right. 
Uh, when was the last one? Well, the last El Nino happened. A Maybe, hey, 2015, yeah. Yeah, we had a it couple of... It happened a while ago. I know we just had La Nina this right. year, but El Nino happened like three, like two, three years three, ago. Three, four years yeah, ago. Yeah, it happened a while ago. And so we have a variety of, uh, for example, flooding. We saw some, some pictures before uh, Charleston, Tennessee. Yeah. We saw fires in Indonesia. Maybe let's have, a, let's have the, the slide one more time up. Uh, so these are, uh, talking about the figure on the right, the fires are large. I mean, yeah. here we're talking about, this is a picture from space, we can see um, Borneo and Sumatra, uh, so really uh, large events we're yeah. talking. Yeah, El Nino, it's insane, the scope of it, and it's insane the damage it causes to people as well as property. and. That's why I think it's very important that we're able to identify a yeah. possible El Nino event because while we are pretty much unable to stop it, we do have an opportunity to try and keep people safer and alert them. So the work you carried out was basically to try and predict the future El Nino events based on uh, data that we have, weather patterns or uh, data that we have. So that's uh, very interesting. How did you do that? So I first started off trying to learn exactly what machine learning was. Turns out it's a very big scope. Um, it really is, yeah. So what I did was I was looking for data that I could trust because that, for me, that's the most important thing. I want data that is included by any other motive. So I chose to stick with NOAA's the NOAA. NOAA's database. Yeah, yeah, because I trust them as a reliable source for all of this. And the problem is they only go back to the 1950s for sea surface temperature, mm. which is genuinely what they believe is a decent or at least a good operator to predict El Nino. They're, if you go on their website, they have a bunch of different methods to predict it, but the two they most care about are the sea surface temperature in a region known as Nino 3.4, which is around the equilateral of the Pacific. Right as well as the wind direction and wind speed in that area, so they're able to measure where it's going, how fast it's going. That's generally what they care most about. Right. What are some of the effects of an El Nino year, uh, for example, here in Hawaii? Um, I believe we have a slide about this, so maybe that can help us to, un oh, okay, uh, yeah. So an El Nino year it, in Hawaii can be, it varies greatly. For sometimes it could just be nothing. Sometimes it would just be unnoticeable. But most of the times it would be hurricanes, floods. This is a, a modis um, uh, image, so from a NASA uh, satellite. Uh, we are looking at. Uh, is that uh, Hawaii in the red square? Yeah. 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 And <laughs> we're we, very we, close. we we this was 2015. So we see uh, three. Uh, really strong looking hurricanes. Yeah. Uh, so this is something that can uh, potentially affect Hawaii. Yeah. But you mentioned also droughts uh, in uh, Indonesia, and fi wildfires, uh, flooding. It, it's something that really doesn't affect only the Pacific, but it's yeah. really something global, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so let's see some of the data uh, that you have used uh, in terms of trying and predict uh, future El Nino events. So uh, these are uh, three figures that you brought us, yes. so what are they? Yeah. So the first one is known as the anomalies plotted through the years. So this starts at 1950 and it shows all the anomalies plotted. So as you can see, the higher spiking anomalies are kind of indi in indicative of an El Nino event, while the lowers are can also be said to be a La Nina. So what's an anomaly? How is it, is it defined here? An anomaly is defined as, well, El Nino is generally defined as a three-season period in which, well, five-season, sorry, five-season period in which the average sea surface temperature is either 0 0.5 degrees higher or 0 0.5 degrees lower than Closer to South America, yeah. as we showed in the cartoon in the first slide, yeah, okay. And the second one is wind speed and sea surface temperature graph. I was really upset that we only were measuring the wind speed in around the 1980s, 1990s. Yeah, we, yeah. We, it's fairly new. So the blue one is basically the wind speed? Yes. And what's the orange one? The orange one is the sea surface temperature. That's why there is a big collusion because I had it on the same graph so it would kind of, so be easier for 
to illustrate. Yeah. And the orange one is just the overall sea surface temperature. Okay, so the, the, the scale on the left is only related to the temperature. Yes. The wind, what's the, the average wind speed that you observed? The average wind speed I observed. Oh, but it's... Uh, it's more or less the direction it's going. Oh, the direction, yeah. okay. But, okay. Wind, but average wind speed was, I think, a knot or so. I, I'm not 100% sure on that fact to be clear. No, no, okay, but yeah. it, 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 we're talking about the direction. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And so, um, in uh, La Nina years, basically, we have uh, strong uh, trade winds in the southern hemisphere, which blows from South America to Asia. And then in El Nino years, do you observe... Uh, uh, a reversal you, or you, lowering the you, you, intensity? You observe the reverse of El Nino. So El Nino and La Nina are both the, they're both extreme effects, but they're the opposite side of the coin. So while El Nino is hotter, La Nina is colder. While El Nino goes the one way, La Nina goes the other way. So right. they're both extremes just in the, the separate direct, the right. direction. And, and the third figure that you brought us? <laughs> that one's my favorite one. That the, All right, this looks... Uh, Complicated. <laughs> that took me like an hour just to graph because I wanted to make it look nicer. So that's actually a three-dimensional graph of what it looks like. So the X dimension is each observation, so you can see it progress. Each observation of, uh, of sea surface temperature and yeah. wind direction. Yes. Yeah, okay. While Y is its actual sea surface temperature, so you can observe each plot over there, and then the Z represents it's wind speed, so you can observe it. Unfortunately, I couldn't give you the GIF of it, but <laughs> it shows. But it's, I was able to rotate it around to show uh, another perspective. So the top down looks a lot more interesting as well as from a forty degree angle. What's telling us th this figure? It's telling us that there is definitely a huge correlation between sea surface temperature, wind speed, as and uh, an El Nino event. I wanted okay. to create this just because. I wanted to be sure for myself. I did trust Noah, but I wanted to see it for myself right. that there <laughs> that's, is a But that's what science yeah. is about. You're verifying and you know trying yeah. to see. Okay, very good. Okay, this is a very good project. And, and so, um, based on what you, based on this Noah data of sea surface temperature as well as a wind direction, wind speed. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, I believe uh, we have a phone call here. Uh, so let's try to answer a call. Uh, so I press this. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So I'm, st I'm still new how it works. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. But in, in the meantime, as we're talking about this, uh, so these El Nino events really—it's uh, something that can, uh, you know, we 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 can experience effects uh, in the global Pacific as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so maybe th this is this time. Let's try answer. Okay, hello, 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 hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> How are you? What's your name and where you're calling from? Hi, this is Linda. I'm calling from Manoa, and I have a question for James. It's such an interesting conversation you're having. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you, Linda. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> so, so you what's have your question? Decades? You have decades of data, and I was thinking, oh, a lot of data. How did you find computers fast enough to process all of your data? That's, that's an amazing question. Um, so there are a lot of open source resources. So I can, you can actually compile your data on your own computer. But what I found to be the best was what you do is you actually have it run on Google's computers or Amazon's computers. So they have a service where you're able to run all of your data and have them compile everything for you, and you just get the results. So Oh, wow, OK. Yeah, it's a very powerful method. It's uh, Google Cloud ser Services or Platforms. I'm a little, little iffy on that, but it's such a wonderful resource to have. You know, when you first sign up, you get $300 in free credits for a year, and it's so powerful. Um, a breakdown of it was I used GPUs. When you w compile data like this, you generally want to use GPUs because they work faster. So I used four GPUs, ran it for 24-7 for a month, only brought my bill up to like $100. Wow. So it's a very powerful, powerful thing to have. And I highly recommend that for anyone who's working with large amounts of data for machine learning. 
Thank you. And, and we also thank um, Linda for yes. asking this question. Thank you, Linda from Manoa. Thank, thank you, you for so watching much. us. Thank you. Um, so this is, uh, how long did it take for you actually to compile using this technology we just mentioned uh, to finish all your, you know, from the beginning of your science project all the way to the results? You know, honestly, it's hard to say because it's, a, it's an ongoing work. Yeah, because I just left it on. I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'll get better results this time. So right, I right. just left it on, and then maybe about a week for my science fair, I grab it, and I'm like, OK, this is my best results. So I start circling <laughs> it. <laughs> OK, time to take a break now. But we'll be back soon. Thank you. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you there. And we're back, we're live, we are Young Talents Making Way, talking about weather and with James Shigemoto here on FinTech Hawaii. Hi, thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you developed, you, you, you got this uh, huge data sets uh, to try and predict future weather El Nino. You process them and, uh, uh, but how do you actually train a computer to, you know, predict uh, future El Nino based on these extrapolations, based on past data sets? So you, there are a lot of different methods you could have used to do it. And at the time, I was not nearly an expert on computers. Well, not computer science, on machine learning. So I decided that the best course of action for me was running an optimization. Right. So I use something known as genetic algorithms to optimize it to make it work the best with the least amount of time on my part so I could focus that on reformatting my data. The science, yeah, yes. the science behind it, yeah, yeah. So let's have our next slide up. I believe it's slide number five, the one you brought us. A, a gene you use genetics algorithm for yes. this particular. What, what is a genetic algorithm? A genetic algorithm, it basically tries to mimic Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. And we are looking at him yes. on the right hand side he's of your very, slide. He's a very good looking man. Wow. <laughs> and we're basically trying to mimic his approach of natural selection into a computer. So what you do is you have two, I don't want to say random because that's kind of undermining what it does but I, 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 I don't know a better word. So basically two random possible solutions. And what you do is you run them multiple times. Well, technically you run all of them multiple times and you find the highest one. So you basically list out its solution. So I guess it's not random. You find the two best fit ones and then you give it a random mutation, like a random change, and you combine them to create this new one. And right. you continue running that until you get the best fit score or its highest accuracy in my case. So instead of me, doing uh, calculus and trying to calculate the, der the derivatives for it, I actually use, just use a genetic algorithm to do it for me. You mentioned this is similar to machine learning, but it's really deep learning. Um, machine learning and deep learning are very similar. Right. Um, deep learning tries to mimic more of the human brain, so they're basically neurons. So it's more like neural networks, algorithm yeah, or neural something. Yeah, neural networks is way closer right. to that. But machine learning is just a broader source. So what I generally use for machine learning was a support vector machine, while for deep learning, I don't know what the correct term was, I created something using TensorFlow and Keras. So I use TensorFlow as a backend and Keras as my front development. And we, I believe we have a slide which really uh, can emphasize more these concepts you're talking about. The slide six, I believe it is. Yeah, maybe if we can have, uh, yeah, this is exactly yeah. what you were mentioning. Right, right. So, Machine learning, it's very similar to artificial intelligence. It's actually underneath like a subsection of it. 
but not exactly it. It's, it's more of a subsection. It uses a lot of data, and that's the most important thing for it. If you don't have a lot of data, well, that's also another thing. If you have too much data, it's not good. So there's an issue known as overfitting. And also, you don't want to start uh, fitting the noise which is yeah. present in the. So you want to train this computer, this uh, you know brain, this brain of the computer, just just right, just enough, yeah. so that we can give us a meaningful scientific results. Yeah. You don't want to overtrain it. You don't want. You don't want to train it. To, it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You don't want to train it too less as well. Yeah. Yeah. What are other? So you're using this for, uh, and we're gonna have a look at your results in a minute. Okay. But um, what are other applications uh, for uh, machine learning? So I'm curious. Yeah. So machine learning, it's such a wide thing. A lot, everything. Well, all of our smartphones use machine learning. So, I, so with a nice example, text prediction uses machine learning. It looks at the most pos, the most likely outcomes. You're like, hey, I'm going to. You're going to probably going to say home or the mall instead of an outer space. Oh, so they look at, for example, uh, in this case, data. Uh, most common messages. Yeah. I'm going home. I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to yeah. school. Yeah. Um, on the way more technical side, what they're trying to do right now. Or I know one researcher is they're trying to remove humans from humans, um, human testing. What they're doing is they're putting all of their data, all of their genetics, into a computer, and then they're giving the other data for the medicine. So, for example, a certain molecule that has a certain effect, like an inhibitor, for example. And what they're doing is they're testing to see how that works on the computer instead of doing it on an actual human, because on the computer you could kill the human, but it's just a bunch of data. But men, people are always there to control, people will always you know, control everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Men, make or sure. Or, <laughs> Not like or, crazy movies we see, you know. It happens, I don't know. Right. <laughs> so uh, let's talk more about your results. What are the outcomes of this modeling? Yeah, and I believe we have our last slide for today. Uh, yeah, okay. So. Uh, what are your results? So in my terms results of, for yeah. using a support vector machine, I use a method known as support vector regression. So normally a support vector machine is just good for classifying, but in my case I used it to calculate the probability. And that's difficult because that's a zero, well a negative infinity to an infinity possible result. So it finds the most likely outcome. And what I did was when I finished doing all the work, I got a uh, 53% accuracy rate consistently. Well, is that uh, considerably? Uh... I, cons I believe it's considerably good getting the exact temperature to the 10th decimal, 53% amount of the time. And I looked through at past data, and most of the time it would get it 90, about 90% 90 of the time when it's not looking at the, its 10th decimal. Right. Do you use um, your model to try and predict future? events at this time, at this stage? Yes. Um, once you have your data fitted, it's, you have to write about five, six lines of code to have it predict. So it's looking at its next possible outcome or the outcome and of the next possible outcome. Part of the code that you used, is that the box on the right we're looking at in this image here? Yes, the box on the right shows the prediction value. I, I, kind, of oh, okay. cleaned, I kind of cleaned it up because you know I didn't really like people seeing all my ugly code. I, my code is very ugly. It's oh, like... Code is beautiful. <laughs> no, I mean, code is beautiful if you make it's it powerful. Easy. You can yeah. you know, do a variety For of me, things. My code was kind of jumbled. I mean, it works, but if a programmer sees it, they'll probably not understand it right. because it's really ugly. So, but what are the outcomes of this code? So, can, can you tell us when the next El Nino is going to... Uh, is going to be, or you're still working on it? I'm still or? working on that. At its stage right now, I can predict the sea surface temperature. Wow. Which is important. Um, what I'm working on right now is predicting its wind speed temperature and having that combined together with my sea surface temperature to create a uh, nice correlational data set. And you've been presenting this uh, uh, science project of yours at the most recent uh, Hawaii State yes. Science and Engineering Fair. How was this experience sharing your your you know your your results, your code, your work with the with the judges and your peers, your fellow students. It was both really stressful and really humbling. I got to see a lot of great minds talk about not just professors, but some of my other competition. They had very very interesting and intricate projects, and it was very stressful because all I'm thinking was 
don't screw up, don't screw up, don't screw up. Just, just speak, <laughs> stop staring, James. <laughs> so very, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, uh, now you mentioned you graduated uh, from graduated. Colony High School, so congratulations on your, you. on your graduation. Uh, what's next in the future? You're going to continue doing, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned your interest in psychology as related to what we're doing here, what, what your project was about. Are you going to continue doing this as part of your college experience? Or? Yes, uh, machine learning, once I got into it, I'm kind of hooked. Um, I am going to continue this in my college years. So I'm going to be majoring in statistics at Capilano Community College. Oh, OK. And then going to go over to UH to see what takes me after that. Right, so, but, but your interest uh, is basically statistics, psychology, machine learning. But um, what would you see yourself doing in the future, for example? As, as a scientist or more like psychologist? Because uh, we have, you know, these two yeah. uh, branches. Yeah. I see myself being a data analyst. I, I really enjoyed and hated working with the data. I enjoyed it because it's, when you, when you it's got... It's a love and hate yeah. relationship. You know, when you get it right, you just feel so happy. When you get it wrong, you just feel so sad. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. But I do, I did enjoy it in the long run. And I did learn a lot about how to clean up data, a lot about how to test data to see, oh, is this data helpful or is this data just noise? And I became decent at that, and I was able to become better at that. And so I feel like when I get older, that's why I'm taking statistics. I want to be a data scientist or data analytic. And uh, we have a variety of data which is now being acquired by sensors or uh, you know space. So big data analysis is really something that uh, everybody is focusing on, including yeah. the economy. And you know, um, we have about one minute left for our conversation now. So how would you like to summarize your work that you've been doing as part of your uh, science fair experience here in Honolulu? The best way I can summarize it was a lot of research, a lot of going on YouTube and trying to figure out, OK, so this correlates to this, time to write this code, a lot of. And even more research coming, I guess. Yes. Yeah. OK. Thank you very Thank much, you so James. Much. Thank you, James, for being with Thank us you today. So yeah. And so um, you've been watching uh, Young Talents Making Way on here on Frank Tech Hawaii. And I'm Andrea Gabrielli. I'm your host. And next Tuesday, we're going we're gonna to be back for more. Stay tuned.